Some of the most misunderstood concepts in suspension design are the anti-properties, anti-lift, anti-dive, and particularly anti-squat. Hello, I'm Hubert Mace, and this is Suspensions Explained. Some of the more fascinating aspects of suspension design are the anti-properties, anti-dive, anti-lift, anti-squat. These properties use the braking and acceleration forces to counteract the effect of weight transfer to help keep the vehicle level. They are similar to how Roll Center helps control roll and cornering, but now instead of looking from the front of the car, we are looking from the side. If you haven't seen my video on Roll Centers, you can check it out here. We will use the same instant center concepts we did with Roll Centers, and we will also connect a line from those instant centers back to the suspension. In fact, the alternative method for finding the roll center that I showed in that video will also work here and is actually the preferred method. Where the anti-properties get tricky is knowing where the line from the instant center to the suspension goes. In the case of roll centers, the line went from the instant center to the tire contact patch. That is true for some of the anti-properties as well, but not all and not in all cases. Knowing the difference is the key to understanding these properties, and we'll talk about that today. To illustrate all these concepts, I want to use anti-squat since it seems to be the most misunderstood in my experience. Let's start from the beginning. Anti-squat is a property that is relevant during acceleration, so let's look at what happens when a car accelerates. We'll use this diagram for our example, and here I've drawn a car that weighs 2,000 kilograms, has a CG height of 0.5 meters, and a wheelbase of 2.5 meters. As the engine rotates the wheels, there is a friction between the tires and the road surface that creates a force which wants to push the car forward. As far as the total vehicle is concerned, this force happens at the tire contact patch. Now, since the force is not in line with the CG, it creates a moment which is equal to the force times the perpendicular distance to the CG, in this case 0.5 meters. This moment is resisted by the wheels, which here are 2.5 meters apart. Let's say we are accelerating at 0.2 g's. The moment will then be 2,000 times the distance to the CG times the acceleration, which equals 200 kilogram meters. Now, I know that kilogram meters is not a proper unit of torque, but stay with me here because it's all gonna come out in the end. We then divide this by the wheelbase and we get 80 kilograms. This is the weight transfer during acceleration. In other words, the front end will effectively get 80 kilograms lighter and the rear will effectively get 80 kilograms heavier. That extra weight pushes down on the springs in the back and makes the back squat down. This is why you see cars lift in the front end and squat down in the rear when they're pulling away from a stop. But what if there was a way we could use the force that is accelerating the car to not only push the car forward, but also push back against the weight transfer? In other words, is there a way to push the car forward and at the same time push the rear of the car back up? Well, there is. Let's imagine that instead of having a suspension, the wheel was instead attached to a pin and the pin was in a slot. So you have a pin riding inside of a slot. The pin is attached to the wheel and the slot is attached to the body. As the engine rotates the wheel, the pin pushes against the side of the slot, which pushes the car forward. But what if we put that slot at an angle? Like this. Now, as the wheel rotates, this pin still wants to push against the side of the slot, but because the slot is at an angle, the pin now wants to slide down the slot as well. But the wheel is constrained by the ground, so it can't slide down, so the only thing it can do is to push the slot up. Now remember, the slot is attached to the body. Remember that we have the weight transfer wanting to push the back of the car down, but now we have the wheel trying to push the body back up. Of course, the higher the angle of the slot, the higher the upward push is going to be. 
Now, at some point, we will have enough angle in our slot that the upward push is going to equal the weight transfer, and the two will cancel each other out. If that happens, the back of the car will not squat at all, but stay right where it is as we accelerate. To find that ideal angle, we need to have one more piece of information about our car. We need to know the drive torque split between the front and the rear axles. If our car is purely rear-wheel drive, then we will have 100% drive torque on the rear axle. But if we have an all-wheel drive car, there will be some torque split between the front and the rear axles. We need to know what that is. To find the ideal angle, we will first draw a horizontal line through the CG and see where that intersects the front axle. Now, we draw a point along this line, which is forward of the rear axle, by a distance equal to the wheelbase multiplied by the percentage of drive torque on the rear axle. For a purely rear-wheel drive, this would be 100%, so we draw a point which is 100% of the wheelbase in front of the rear axle, which would be right here. Then, we draw a line from that point to the rear axle contact patch. Like that. The angle between that line and the ground is the ideal angle that we want our slot to be at. In other words, the angle of our slot, if it equals this angle, we will perfectly cancel the weight transfer with the acceleration force. But what if we had an all-wheel drive car and we had, say, 30% of the torque going to the front axle and 70% going to the rear? In that case, we would draw our point 70% of the wheelbase in front of the axle. Approximately here. And then draw our line from that point to... Uh, if I could draw a straight line, that would be better. And now, the ideal angle becomes this angle here. You can see how having less torque going to the rear axle means our angle has to be bigger. This makes sense, since we have less force to work with, but the weight transfer is still going to be the same. We need more angle in our slot to counteract the same weight transfer force, since the acceleration force coming from the rear is less. So how do we design a suspension that acts as if it is riding in our imaginary slot? This is where the concept of instance centers comes in, and it's very similar to what we did with roll centers, only this time we're looking at the suspension from the side. We'll use a computer model to illustrate. Here we have a double wishbone suspension with a tie rod. Front of the car is to the left. The classic way to find the instant center of a double wishbone suspension is to draw lines through the inner bushings of the upper and lower arms and project them until they cross, like this. Just like in the case of roll centers, this is the instantaneous center about which the suspension rotates as it moves up and down, and just like with roll centers, we need to draw a line from this point to the suspension to find the angle of the motion of the suspension. The question is, where in the suspension do we draw this line to? This is where anti-squat gets tricky. The answer is, it depends. It depends on where the differential is mounted. The reason we care where the differential is mounted is because we need to know whether the reaction to the drive torque is going through the suspension or not. Here is what I mean. As the engine applies torque to the half shafts going to the wheels, there is an equal and opposite torque happening in the differential. If the differential is connected to the body, like it would be in an independent suspension, then the differential just pushes on the body and all the suspension sees is a force at the wheel center. We can use this wheel to illustrate. As the engine torque tries to twist the wheel, a force is generated at the contact patch. As the wheel tries to move forward, it pushes on the suspension in the only place where the two are attached, which is here at the wheel center. There is no connection between the wheel and the suspension at the contact patch because there is no part of the suspension that exists there. There is only a connection here at the bearing, so the only place where the wheel can push on the suspension is here at the bearing. It can't push on it at the contact patch. However, if the differential is connected to the suspension, a good example of this would be a live axle, where the entire axle, including differential, is connected to the suspension,
We have the same drive torque at the wheels and reaction torque at the differential, but now the differential is not connected directly to the body, but is instead connected to the suspension. So it is the suspension that is carrying the torque. This has the effect of projecting the drive force down to the tire contact patch and makes the suspension act as if the force were being applied at the contact patch instead of at the wheel center. So when it comes to drawing the line from the instant center to the suspension, we need to draw it to the point where the acceleration force is being applied. Going back to our computer model, we have an independent suspension. So we will draw our line from the instant center to the wheel center like this. Now we can measure the angle between that line and the line parallel to the ground. Unfortunately for us in this case, we see that that line actually goes in the wrong direction. If we keep this suspension design, we will have what is called pro squat, meaning the car will squat even more. To fix it, we would need to change the angle of the upper and lower arms so that the instant center ends up higher than it is now. A classic example of a real car that had pro squat is the old Triumph TR6. It was squat like crazy under acceleration because the instant center was placed too low. The last thing we need to do is to compare the angle of the line we just drew to the ideal slot angle that completely cancels out the weight transfer. Because anti-squat, along with all the other anti-properties, is quoted as a percentage. If the angle of our line is half of the ideal angle, then we would have 50% anti-squat. If the angle were equal to the ideal angle, then we would have 100% anti-squat. In the case of our computer model, we actually have a negative angle, since our line goes the wrong way. So we would have a negative anti-squat percentage, or pro-squat. Really, we would not put this design into a production car without making changes that would raise the anti-squat angle, but it does illustrate the concepts that go into determining the anti-squat of a suspension. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that the alternative method for finding the instant center would apply here as well, and that is true. As is the case with the roll centers, it is fairly straightforward to find the bushings on the upper and lower control arms, draw a line through them, and find out where those lines intersect. However, for other suspension types, it's not quite so straightforward, such as in a multi-link. Just like in the case of the roll centers, it's not clear where to draw the lines in a multi-link suspension, and so we need to use the alternative method to find the instant center for those architectures. Let's go back to our computer model and see how this works. As was the case with the roll center, what we'll do is move the suspension up and down a small amount and look at how the suspension moves. In the case of an independent suspension, we'll look at how the wheel center moves. In the case of a live axle, we will look at how the contact patch moves. Once we know where the wheel center or the contact patch is, after we've moved the suspension up and down a little bit, we can connect the dots just like we did for the roll center, make a perpendicular line, and that line will be the line along which our instant center must lie. And, as was the case with the roll center, it doesn't matter where along that line the roll center actually sits, all we need to know is what is the angle of that line. Once we have the angle of the line, we can compare it to the angle of our ideal line, just like we did with a geometric method. In conclusion then, the key to understanding anti-squat is knowing what type of suspension we have and whether the torque reaction in the differential passes directly into the body or travels through the suspension, since this determines where on the suspension we draw the line from the instant center. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit that subscribe button and notifications, and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.